Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Have you seen the famous movie The Matrix? I hope you have, as it will help you understand the context of today's episode, which is heart-hitting, I must say, and perhaps not for the faint-hearted, but so very important. If you follow my podcast, you know that I don't shy away from controversial topics and question everything in the name of truth about our existence. By truth, I mean the knowledge, information, and insights that are normally hidden from plain view, or at least are invisible to most people, or what we are simply not paying attention to. To me, truth is a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, with millions of pieces we need to put together in a way that is meaningful and makes sense to us, individually and collectively. And just when we thought we've got it right, reaching out for those last few missing pieces. We are jolted out of our relaxed, dreamy state as those pieces don't fit neatly on the puzzle board as most others did. Some are the big question marks, some make us stop and think, and some are the lightning bolts of the aha moments rewriting the narrative of our beliefs. Today's episode falls into this category. Together with my special guest, Kate Montana, we are going to hack the matrix. So fasten your seatbelt and come with us for the ride. Kate is a professional journalist specializing in the fields of psychology, consciousness, alternative medicine, and health. With a master's degree in psychology, Kate speaks and teaches about consciousness, ego development, spirituality, and the nature of interdimensional influences. She has been interviewed on hundreds of TV and radio shows and podcasts, including Gaia's Open Minds and Coast to Coast AM with George Nori. You will find more information about Kate and her work on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Kate has written several books in various genres, and the most recent one, Cracking the Matrix, published in April last year, is the center of this very uncommon conversation. Hello, Kate. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Hey, Anna. It's good good to be here. I had to laugh when you said, and it came out last year, and I was like, last year? No, it came, no, it came out last year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are in the, in the new year now, so it uh, seems like ages ago. <laughs> yes, no kidding. When we're talking last year. Okay, I have read your book. Kate, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the best opening would be to say that in my view, this book is a must read for everyone. So my advice to every listener of this podcast is do yourself a big favor and read this book. And I'm talking, of course, about Cracking the Matrix. I'd like to take a different approach to this conversation and rather than asking you to tell us your story, I'd like to jump right into the topic, as your story is very much intertwined with it, and just invite you to share the relevant parts of your journey as we jump from one limb onto another and dive into deep, deep rabbit holes. Would it be okay? <laughs> That's fine with me. I like rabbit holes. <laughs> I said in my intro that this episode is hard-hitting, 
as in your book, you pull no punches, and I'm sure that this will come out in our conversation. You broke a spiritual taboo, opened a Pandora's box that everyone needs to see. You don't mince your words in a nice way. (laughs) You call a spade a spade, and I love your raw honesty, fueled by your genuine passion to shake up the status quo. I'd like to open our conversation with a quote from your book, which I feel is a good synopsis. You said, I started this book because I wanted to expose the presence of an anti-life force on this planet and how religions, spirituality, and social systems support evil in many ways. I also wanted to shine a light on the astonishing fragility of the modern picture of reality most humans live by. Could you please tell us about your message of cracking the matrix and why you felt compelled to write about it? Yeah, you're right. The book is is completely intertwined with my with my personal journey. And, uh, um, you know, fundamentally, I've been on the spiritual path for 40 years. And uh, I worked with the filmmakers of the movie, uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? I worked with the filmmakers of What the Bleep for six, seven years. And so I was um, inextricably combined with the whole consciousness movement and the awareness of, of the importance of the mind and consciousness affecting reality. And, you know, and that was the whole time of you, you have to be so positive and everything was focused on the light and the positivity bubble and you don't look at anything negative because then you're going to attract it to you. So I never questioned any of that. And then, um, and then you know, a couple of years, and then 2020 happened and COVID showed, showed up on everybody's doorstep and the world went nuts. And I, I had to just step back from everything I thought I knew at that point. And I looked at the world gone mad and, you know, and, and governments and, and agencies, you know, falling into obfuscation, pure out lies, totalitarianism kind of right. All this stuff was going on. And I was like, what the heck, what the heck? And what am I missing? What am I not seeing? You know, we, you know, 2,500 years after, after Buddha, talked about enlightenment and brought those lessons of enlightenment to humanity. 2,000 years after Jesus walked this earth and taught about eternal life and love. Why are things so screwed up? The self-help industry alone is like this. It's it's a multi-billion dollar industry every year. We want to be good people. We strive to be good people. And yet everything is falling apart. So when that happened, I had to go, well, you know, something else is going on. And the only thing I had never looked at was I'd never turned around and looked at the, I'd never looked at evil. And because what I was watching happen, Anna, I didn't have any other word for it, but evil. Things being perpetrated on helpless humanity um, that that were unspeakable. So I started researching um, about what I called evil at that point, um, and and I was shocked. <laughs> Boy, was I shocked to discover that there wasn't a single civilization for the last meh, five thousand years on any continent on this planet that didn't have a name for for a a debilitating, degenerative, degenerating anti life non-physical interdimensional influence on humanity a negative influence on humanity every 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 culture talked about it and yet and then i was like oh my god for example of course the uh the greeks the ancient greeks called um these beings the archons um i live in hawaii the the kahunas call it the eepa the the whispering ones let me see. The, of course, the Christians refer to this as, as Satan or the devil. Um, it's Abaddon or Ashatan in Islam. It's uh, um, and and uh, and in Hebrew, it's Abaddon. Um, the the Native Americans refer to it as Windingo or Witiko. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And every, I was just shocked to realize, oh my God, we've known about this for thousands of years. Everybody's known about it. I've done a lot of plant medicine with working with shamans down in the uh, Amazon region of Ecuador and Peru over the years. 
all of the authentic jungle shamans I've worked with, they deal with these, they call them demons, they're just flat out they're demons. They, they, they work with these energies all the time. This is nothing new to them. And so I was finally like, well, holy moly, okay. So then the next question that raised its ugly head was, well, okay, if everybody's known about this for thousands of years, why don't we know about it? You know, it's, it's like the biggest hidden non-secret on the planet. And so then a lot of the book goes into, well, why is it still a hidden presence? Why is, why, and, and which is, which is part of its agenda is to stay hidden because it's non-human and non-physical. So it's pretty easy to stay invisible if it's non-physical. So there's, but I, I saw, I, I uncovered step-by-step step all of these different agendas to make, to ensure that what I call now the archons or the anti-life intelligences um, remain hidden and their influence so that their influence can be perpetuated. So was indeed a rabbit hole and continues to be a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, thank you. Uh, what, what a powerful introduction to your story and your journey. To take this further now uh, in, in our conversation, I'd like to quote, um, I'd like to read another quote from your book. Humanity is and has been for some time in the grip of a powerful, intelligent, interdimensional force an all-pervasive, destructive influence that has thrived on this planet, sucking most of humanity into its orbit, much like a black hole swallows everything that comes within its gravitational grasp, including light. Now, most people in spiritual circles working with esoteric issues don't believe in the anti-life force, at least in the way you have described it, I've had guests on this very show who teach that we are such powerful divine beings that no negative energy can ever penetrate our aura or influence us in any way. And those people are absolutely convinced that this is the case, quoting a direct spiritual guidance they receive on this subject matter. So are we... As, as the collective and as individuals in denial? Ah, well, uh, first off, I'd like to say they're absolutely right. We are beings of pure love. Our, we, are the most, we are the most potent creators. Our, our light in, and is infinite. Our love is infinite. And by love, I don't mean any sort of, you know, trivialized, romanticized, sexualized um, idea about love, love, you know, what love is, and what has been made in mainstream media. I'm talking about the, the life force that creates universes and, and then disintegrates them with equal impartiality and passion. So, when, you know, so we are, that's what we are. We're beings of pure love life. Wow. That given, if we can be convinced as the creators that we are, that we are pieces of poo, that we are corrupt, that we are violent, aggressive, incorrigible, that we're lazy, incalcitrant, that we are, that we're stupid, that we're selfish and greedy and amoral. If we can be convinced that we are that, and we have been convinced that we are that, there's been a 5,000 year agenda to convince us that we are exactly that, that we were degenerate. Yeah. Then as creators, we make it so. Mm, with the mortal sin and yeah. all the rest of it. Oh, the whole, the whole concept of original sin. And I, at one point in time, I'd love to get into the whole thing about original sin at some point in our conversation. Um, but the, the whole agenda, and th this is the insidious, brilliant, if you will, aspect of the archons, is that they, it's an invisible, non-physical intelligence. It doesn't have enough power to pick up a piece of tissue paper. <laughs> so if something doesn't have enough power to pick up a piece of tissue paper, and it wants to wreak havoc and basically insinuate itself into a physical life form like humanity, 
who are really not physical, we're spirit, we're pure beings of love. If it wants to insinuate itself into our bodies and our lives and if essentially take us over and have what we have, a planet, physical embodiment, um, life as you will, um, then the only way they can manage to do that is to use us to create its agenda for it, to implement it physically, because it has no influence physically. So, yes, we are incorruptible, but we can become totally confused and we can be and we can dim our own light. Yes, we can hide our own light. We can turn to we can, you know, I. I've got, I, I know friends, I have friends who, you know, <laughs> their parents were um, in the St. Germain Foundation, spiritual people by day, and by night they were, um, they, they did satanic rituals, group, you know, group ritual rape of their five-year-old daughter, um, tortured her to, until she committed um, infanticide, um, you know, compartmentalized, traumatized, you, you know, so, so, it's possible to twist. It's called the twisted light. You know, we never lose our essence, but we can lose track of it. And then as creators, we can create a whole different freaking reality. And that's what we've got. Called it. That's why I called it the matrix. We are in a mental matrix of our own creation, but we've been influenced by these interdimensional forces that have, um, can insinuate those the their thought patterns into our mental structure into our emotions into our physical structure into our spiritual bodies wherever we're wounded wherever we have trauma wherever we have distanced ourselves from ourselves and and don't want to be present in our life in our body that's the doorway that this influence can come in and so yes it is a it is a takeover at that point, it is there is absolutely such a thing as possession. So um, yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's really brilliant. It's just like that's one of the reasons the whole spirituality community has gone. Well, you know, we're beings of light and we're love and, and nothing can ever touch us. Yeah. And. <laughs> Yes, but this brings me to two important points. One, is this a chicken and egg scenario? In other words, which comes first? Our weakness and our emotional shadow that opens the door to those influences or the other way around. And I'd like to actually make, because you, you write beautifully about this in your book, I'd like to make the connection between our natural, if you like, from the psychology point of view, emotional shadows that we all have and the evil influences of those negative forces. And the question here is, if those shadows are natural part of our psyche, then how exactly those anti-life forces influence us? Do they merge with those shadows? Do they, uh, do they enlarge those shadows? What's the what's what's happening there? Uh, I wish I could say that I had a definitive. Well, this is exactly how it is, Anna. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I've learned is is not to be um, that egotistical. <laughs> <laughs> to think I know everything and have all the answers. Um, what do you think? My my gut sense of it, and I trust that because that's who I really am. Is is that is that powerful, unlimited being of pure love? Is that yeah? No, there that we we didn't come in with shadows. This has been an influence that has come from a completely different source. When this boy does this crack open a a, a can of worms. Um, one of the things that I've never been able to figure out, and probably most any logical, rational human being hasn't been able to figure out, is how if we come from a source of love, if God is love, if, you know, let's, let's take the monotheistic, there's only one source, one love, it's love. How can that one source of love have possibly created ritual torture of a, of a child or an animal? or done any of the so many horrific things, commit war and atrocities, torture. How is that possible? 
what happens is that we end up convincing ourselves because we we take we take the assumption that there is only one source and we run with it and this is one of the the shocking things that happened to me during this whole two year process of, of investigating and writing this book is that I came face to face with the possibility that made sense to me was that, oh, my God, this influence, these interdimensional beings come from a completely different source. They do not come from the light. They do not come from love. They come from a different source. And it was like, when I hit that, and I can't, I can't take credit for that. I was listening to a wonderful woman by the name of Jacqueline Hobbs. Um, also known as Oracle Girl, an amazing being. And she was talking about something and then she just slid this, oh, by the way, you know, these interdimensional forces are from a different source. And it was like the light bulb went off in my brain. And I was like, well, finally, that makes sense. And I don't have to start, I don't have to do the fandango of trying to figure out how evil comes from love. You know, because we've got all these stories. When we take the the everything is love story and run with it and an assumption that it's the truth, then we have to justify it. Well, okay, Earth, we're in Earth school, and everything is you know is okay in Earth school because it's all just a learning, and we're gonna grow, and then next lifetime it's all okay. And I looked at that and I was like, what a load of hooey. What a way to excuse, you know, I, I mean, I cannot tell you how arrogant and how actually brutally callous I was with that kind of a spiritual attitude, because I could pass, you know, starving people in India and go, well, this is their karma, this is their, they're learning on the earth school this lifetime and blow it off. I didn't mean to, I meant to be a loving, gentle, open, kind person, but I had this, this story that I was following that made it all okay, that made torture okay, that made child abuse okay. I mean, as far as you can make it okay, justify it, that it comes from love. It was like, yeah, okay. And so we have these stories that we make up and these illusions that we get lost in and then try to justify. And it's like, wow, talk about trying to untwist your. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And I actually want to thank you for uh, bringing this issue up in your book. I find it absolutely fascinating, but there is more to it than what you have described, I think. Now, this breaks the current paradigm of one source, obviously. Yeah. I have gone past the multi-god theory, even on a vertical scale, not just horizontal, as I feel that our God has their God who has also their own God as their boss, as it were, and so on. And I talked about this with a few other guests on my show. And of course, living in a multiverse is a given as far as I'm concerned. But talking about another source, that's something else. And 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 here, here is my punchline. When I read about it, what I immediately thought about was that this could explain another concept, which is a paradox, or has been up until now, the concept of non-existence. I have heard and read from you know a number of sources referring to this place, for the lack of a better word, of non-existence, which obviously is illogical and doesn't make any sense when you have one source, which is everywhere and everything. But when you have two or even more sources, then the gaps between them could very well be the mythical places of non-existence. What do you think? That makes sense. <laughs> I mean, it, it would explain, it would explain that, that theory. Yeah, well, and, and, and again, I would, I would say, and it's a theory, and if there's any trap in the world, if there's any matrix that's so sticky that you can swallow anything, including the uh, the concept of non-existence, which is, in my uh, experience, um, it's a theory. It's it's more mental construct. Yeah, it's it's a mental construct. The, you know, 
I mean, but by the very fact of you say, well, something is is doesn't exist, it already exists in its non-existence. So it's like, oh, please. So, you know, I'm so tired of I'm so tired of the mind. I mean, the mind is a tool, but but it, you know, we've we've let it really run amok and and get out of control. And one of the things that I've really come to realize is the mind, the mental, intellectual, intellectual mind is not native to us either. There is a totally different mind that is available to us once the huh, left brain chatter um, subsides a bit and and um, something else can get a nonverbal word in edgewise. Um, mm. but no, but that but that's very interesting. And you know, <laughs> I hate to even you know, I'll go here. Um, I, you know, <laughs> it, but at the end of the day, this whole journey ultimately took me to the place where I don't believe in God anymore. Uh huh. The whole concept, the whole co back to concepts again. Yeah. The whole idea that there's a hierarchical structure, and that there's something above anybody or anything else is um, suspect at best. And so here's the here here's the kicker that 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 booted me into the there's no such thing as God. It's an idea in our heads, and we've it's been planted because if you really go down the God path. There is more strife, war, dissension, despair. The, the, the amount of, of personal power, personal, shouldn't use that word. The, the amount of power that we give over of our own light. We give away our light by the bucketful to God, outside this source outside of ourselves. It's insidious. It's invidious. It's 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 is one of the most divisive, debilitating, crippling concepts that has ever been perpetrated on humanity. So who created the matrix? Oh well, I'd say we are. Let me let me finish that. Let me finish that last thought. What okay. made me realize? <laughs> what made me realize is that okay. So um, I, as I say, forty years in meditate. Well, twenty years meditating. When I found out about enlightenment back in nineteen eighty five, I was like, that's it. I want to become enlightened. And I'm a very um, driven person, very young, <laughs> very, very, you know, go for it. I probably in 20 years easily meditated 25,000 hours, easily. I was just on it day and night. I meditated and I didn't have any technique. I didn't have a teacher really that taught me a meditation technique. I focused on one singular question. Who am I? What am I? And just looked within and looked within and looked within and looked within. Well, so finally, you know, you you can't uh, back to what the bleep do we know? Consciousness and energy creates the nature of reality. You can't be that focused, that obsessive about anything and not have at least some something show up. So about in 2007 in October, I opened my eyes after you know, meditating and, you know, that, that, you know, that you know, it's easy to go into bliss and an expansion and oneness on your Zazen pillow with your eyes closed, but then you open your eyes and wham, there you are and your mortgage is back and your sick dog is back and your, you know, your whatever is back. And it's just like, oh, where did my bliss go? Where did my oneness go? Where did my connection to God go? That one morning I opened my eyes and Kate didn't come back. Uh, and and it was like, oh, <laughs> and for three days, pretty much all I did was belly laugh because it was absolutely astonishingly clear to me that I was not Kate Montana. I was not human. I was not physical. I understood all those things. I certainly didn't lose track of who I thought I used to be. And um, but what a joke. Now I know why so many statues of Buddha, you know, see him laughing. It's because it's 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 cosmic in the extreme, the joke. Well, anyway, one of the one of the things that became really apparent in that three-day period, actually within probably the first hour, although it was a timeless time, um, is that, is that I looked at my life, I looked downstream and I saw that I would never die. My body would drop. But if my body had dropped in the garden that morning, it wouldn't have made a particle bit of difference. I would have continued on. But what really got me was when I looked upstream and realized I'd never been born. Okay. <laughs> I'd never been born. I always was. I always will be. That's the nature of eternity. Always am, always are, never born. So if I was never born and I'm eternal, then I was not created. 
there was no creator god created me and put me in motion so that just you know when i finally put that together on top of all my other investigations these last few years was like oh i mean and you really stop to think about it anna how how diminishing how demeaning to have a being an eternal being of pure love begin to think oh well something created me oh well something created me out of dirt out of dust huh yeah i'm 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 a lowly worm okay yeah i'm a lonely lowly creature and i you know i dare not even lift my eyes up to the lord oh holy moly so yeah, there, there, there have been a lot of edifices. There's been a lot of different um, threads in the matrix that just completely unraveled for me these last couple of years and left me gasping. At this point, I'd like to go back to my earlier point about which came first, the chicken or the egg, in terms of uh, those uh, negative influences. And just to play a bit of a devil's advocate, pun not intended, (laughs) (laughs) how would you respond to an argument that by blaming some external forces, some evil forces, you are taking away the responsibility from an individual for their mistakes, wrongdoings, and failures. How can we reconcile those two concepts, or how could you explain it? Well, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, well, number one, we're taught to blame ourselves, number one. We're taught that we're always to blame, that there's something wrong with us, that we are dysfunctional, that we are broken. So the blame game is part of the game of convincing us that we are less than what we are. It's part of it the, because these this this interdimensional influence. If you had to, you know, put one hand way up above your head and then another hand way below your waist and go, we're at pure beings of pure love. We're up above our head up here. And these interdimensional influences, which I call anti-life, because they're entropic. They always take something or a person or an or an idea to its lowest common denominator. It's where they function at a very low level, frequency level. So the trick is to get us to match frequencies. They can't do it. They're stuck where they are. They're not going to elevate themselves, cannot elevate themselves, do not understand love, don't even grasp the concept. But they are one of the signature frequencies of it is it is it's a very greedy, insatiable, feeding, parasitic energy. Okay. It wants what we've got. It wants life. It wants what it hasn't got. So the only way it's going to get it is for us to bring our own light down. So we're really good at blaming ourselves. <laughs> You know, and 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 what are we supposed to take responsibility for? Well, essentially, what was what what I heard you just say is that we have to take responsibility for all the crappy things we're doing. Absolutely. Are we complicit? Sure. Are we lazy? Yeah. Are we greedy? Can be. Can we be violent, aggressive? Can we be all of those things we've been taught we're supposed to be? Yes. That said, we're also not to blame because our pure beings of love, our essential essence and the and where we started out had nothing to do with this influence and nothing to do with the shadows and nothing to do with violence and aggression and pain and suffering and taking sadistic pleasure in eliciting pain and watching somebody suffer. That is not us. That's this other source frequency. So are we complicit? Yes. Do we now have shadow material we have to deal with? Yes. Have we been wounded and hurt and suffer? Yes. Are we totally to blame for all of this situation we're in? Absolutely not. So what I'm hearing is that essentially, and this this is this is as simple as it as it can go, and at the same time, as as difficult perhaps to to grasp is that all we need to do 
is to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, as the saying goes. In other words, yes, to realize where we are and to reach out within to the strength that we have maybe hidden somewhere at the very bottom. And rather than depending on some external, again, helps and, and, and influences in the first instance, to recognize that we have this innate power to bring ourselves from the dark place, if that's where we are in, in the moment, and to pull ourselves literally by the bootstraps. Is this, am I he hearing correctly? Um, not really. Um, <laughs> like, and I love what you said. All we need to do is because it's just, re it's really, all we need to know is who we're, who we really are, be who we really are and be it. Yeah, that's all we have to do. Boy, it's simple to say, <laughs> not so simple to do 40 years of, of work later. Um, you know, pulling ourselves up our bootstraps, you know, the thing of it is, is we don't have to pull ourselves up by anything. We already are beings of pure love. You know, we have been put on this self-improvement hamster wheel where, you know, we have to pull ourselves up the bootstraps. We have to do something to make us other than what we are, which is degenerate, dysfunctional, unhappy, miserable, cruel, greedy, blah, blah, blah. See, we've bought into the story. If I'm going to mm. have to improve myself, you know, mm. I'm still in the story of self-improvement. How can you self-improve your love? When I, when I, here's the, here's the kicker. How can I become what I already am? I can't, but I can be seduced and tricked into thinking that I have to struggle, strive, learn, grow, meditate. You know, I tell you what, one of the things that blew my mind actually was when I realized that the essential message of Society, religion, and new age spirituality was identical. It was, you're not enough. In society, I had to self-improve. I had to be richer, thinner, more successful, richer, have a bigger car. I had to be better. I had to do all that stuff. Same thing in religion. I had to be holier. I had to be more pure. I had to make sure I didn't, I, you know, I didn't have sex before marriage. I had to do all these, follow the rules and then, Maybe God would deign to look at me. Spirituality. I've got to be higher. I've got to be my Christ self. I've got to be my higher self. I've got to be my light body. I've got to be, you know, I've got to be something out there. I mean, I spent 20 years focusing on getting out of my body because I thought the body was the bad place. And I was supposed to get out there to God someplace. Well, so so back to this whole you know, we're on this hamster wheel of self-improvement. We've bought it. We're pieces of poo. We're dysfunctional. We're broken. We have to fix ourselves. Oh, <sighs> not true. What we have to see is the lie we've bought, that we are dysfunctional, that we are these aggressive, violent, greedy, cruel, despicable, lowly worms. That's what we, we got to see the lie. And when you see the lie, then you're left like, oh my God. What's left when you lie? The amount of empowerment, Anna, that has come from this journey that I've been on, finally turning around and looking at these dark forces and these dark places, thinking they're all in me. That's the gig. Convince me that I'm bad and wrong and dark and evil. That's the gig. I, that's why we don't look. You know, either it's outside of us or and it's too scary. It's made scary. The devil with the with the horns and the forked tail and the hooves and the red skin. That's scary. I don't want to look at that. Okay, so I'm not going to. So that's one way religion deals with this is don't look at it because it's too scary. New Age comes along and goes, oh, don't look at it. You're nothing but the light. And if you look at the dark, then you're being negative and drawing it to you. So again, it's don't look. Don't look, don't look. And what's at the bottom of all that is the absolute subconscious belief that I'm a dysfunctional, broken person that has to be fixed. And I saw the lie, Anna, and I realized, oh, my God, I am not that. I bought that story. <gasps> I'm a being of pure love. <sighs> I am a being of pure love. 
I am infinite. I am eternal spirit of pure love. For the first time in my life in 40 years of, of spiritual searching and seeking and striving and meditating and hamster wheel self-improving, for the first time I was able to relax into my own being and be it. I didn't have to do anything. I already am a being of pure love. All I had to do was see the lie, face it, and go, oh, my God, that's not me. <gasps> yeah. Thank you. This is a this is actually a very important conversation and so important that I have decided to um, bring up a, a topic which is very sensitive. But equally, I feel it's really important to include this in this conversation. I recently watched a, a documentary here on our TV in, in Australia about eating disorders, uh, in particular anorexia. It was very confronting, showing young women literally wasting away as they refused to eat, with their mind completely separated and disconnected from their body. Now, while we don't fully understand anorexia, we know that this is a psychological disorder, or we call it a psychological disorder. But there was something said in this documentary that really caught my attention. Both those sick women and their mothers repeatedly said that they are not themselves. Even when they looked into their daughter's eyes, they did not recognize them, that there was someone else inside, some evil force that drives them to their demise with such negative, destructive, and self-loathing thoughts, which they recounted on, on that doco, that they are not good enough, not worthy to live, and so they must not eat and have to die. I mean, it was heartbreaking just to listen to those words. And to me, it was instantly clear that these women are taken over by some evil energies, evil entities, that at some point in their life, they give their power away to somehow. And because it is so important, and my understanding is that cases of anorexia and similar eating disorders are growing exponentially in the world, with people saying, I'm, get, I'm having those thoughts in, in my head that I'm worth nothing, I'm, I don't deserve to live, etc. So, if such a person listens to this podcast or knows someone in such a fragile state, what could you say to them that would help them take their power back, reconnect with their bodies, and embrace life? You're not asking much, <laughs> intuitively oh god you know the yeah no the whole the whole shame self-hatred self-loathing the death the death the death wish um is part of this the vibration of the this interdimensional these interdimensional beings um somebody they're very clear that they're not themselves there is there has they have been literally taken over by this by this frequency by this intelligence and, you know, and the repetitive thoughts, you know, yes, it's our brain having the thoughts, but we're being impulsed. It's the constant impulsing. So how to break that is, it, isn't that the $64,000 question? You know, oh, well, just love yourself. It's just like, oh, you know, to, to, to say something so ludicrous um, and so obvious at the same time is, is hurtful. I wish I knew the answer to that, you know, whatever, you know, I've learned that the most I can do is start to lean in. If I want to heal, if I want to be the being of pure love that I really am, then my job is to address the forces, the voices, the impulsing that is taking me away from that state. So one of the things that I talk about in Cracking the Matrix is, you know, it, this is, it's a heavy topic. And I was like, in my book, I really wanted to make sure that, uh, on, that I uplifted people and gave them things to do to help get them out of the pit. Because we are, humanity's in a freaking pit. 
and some in a in a more yeah and some in a more painful pit than others and and anorexia has a very high mortality rate it's it's really it's terrifying so myself and i coach people to learn to start to listen to their intuition to start to listen to that still small voice try to find it somewhere find some moment a breath whatever of space to start to listen to a different voice boy somatic tracking all right here's the deal huh. and anorexia this is this is so perfect is we have been taught that the body is corrupt i could go into a whole conversation we don't have time about original sin where that came from it actually came from these interdimensional beings though so the whole and epigenetic shame and programming religious programming for hundreds of generations have stamped shame and self-loathing and a dis and a horror of the body and a desire to get rid of the body um into our very dna so number one it's not you number two it is part of your genetic and ancestral patterning number three it is in every commercial is being pulsed in the airwaves to hate yourself to tear yourself down and to and basically destroy yourself you are being impulsed by em frequencies by chemtrails by polluted food you've got there's so much that we are all up against so it's not you and number three it's not you so you've got these influences so how to get out of this I spent so many decades focused on getting out of my body because my body's the bad place and out there to God is the good place. Well, I'm just, it's 180 degrees. The Everything has been inverted in this sick society that we have been impulsed to create, this death space that we are being driven to create ourselves. So everything is inverted. So instead of out there to God, it's down into my body is my safe place. Of course, if you're anorexic or you have other OCD issues and use or you're cutting or whatever the the or alcoholism, drug addiction, and it's all hatred of the body and a, and and an impulse to self-destruct for death. And it's those marginalized death spaces where these interdimensional influences can come in, feed, and take over. So I spend a lot of time somatic tracking getting into my body. I don't meditate really anymore. I don't even, I don't need to, but it's just like, but I do focus on being in my body. And, and I don't know if you understand somatic tracking, but it's just like, put your feet on the ground, bare feet on the earth, go sit under a tree without your phone and let nature hold you. Nature is the life impulse. It's going to counteract the death impulse so go sit in nature quietly no phone no external frequencies pulsing you which is what they do whether your phone is turned off or not go sit out in nature put your feet bare feet on your ground your butt on the ground and start going into your start with your feet what does my right foot feel like my toes can i feel my toes is there energy there is there any color in my right foot? Wow. Oh, is that itchy? What is that feeling in my right foot? My right ankle, my left foot, my left ankle. Work your way. Just go in and sense whatever you're feeling in your, in your calves and then your knees and your thighs and then your groin and then your genital region, your butt, all the way up to the crown of your head. Tune into your body. Now, the beautiful thing about the body We've been taught it's the bad place, okay? It isn't. The beautiful thing about the body is the body doesn't lie. The body isn't even freaking physical. There is nothing physical about this planet. It's all energy. There is no teeny tiny little particle of physicality at the bottom of the atomic, you know, structure. It's all quantum waves of, of interpenetrating fields of energy. So we're not even physical, okay? So anyway. So be with that sensations because the body is reading energy fields around it all the time. And so the last thing we're taught to do is trust ourselves, right? We're always taught, we're taught from school, from religion, mom and dad, society, trust your doctor, trust your teacher, trust your guru, go to the politicians, go to the economists, go to the philosophers, go to the gurus, whatever, looking outside for answers. Nope. 
It's all in. Jesus, what did Jesus said it? The kingdom of heaven is within. The information is within. And it's in the body because the body is, is energy. Your energy. The body is energy. So when you start tuning into the energy field of your body and start reading those, the information, turn left here. Oh, don't eat that. Do well, do eat that. Or wear this color today. Or ooh, don't go to that party. Ooh, don't get in the car with that person. Ooh, take that job. You know, the more we can tune into the body and its messages and start to trust and build gently, step by baby step, our, our, our trust in ourselves and this other kind of messaging, that begins to push that other influence out. That begins to push your, that other influence out. There is no more important tool than sincerity. If you really passionately, sincerely desire, sincerely desire to heal and get better, then that, you know, that's your creative being. That is going to be put into motion. The trick is to learn what to listen to, your inner being, your inner heart, your gut, your heart. Always follow the heart as best you can. It will never lead you astray. It'll lead you into some pretty wild places that look completely logically crazy, but it'll always keep you safe because it's life, not the death impulse. It's life. So focus on everything that is life-bearing. That's why I say get out in nature. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I have really resonated with what you said because that was my initial intuitive instinctive thought. Number one, reconnect with your body because this is a clearly a disconnect from the body. And and then at the same time, reconnect with that love and the voice of truth of who you are within yourself. Yeah. And starting from, you know, a tiny moment, as you said, you know, like a grain of sand. And as you grow it, your understanding and your appreciation of your own power will grow with it and it will grow exponentially. So this is, I guess, what I mean by pulling yourself by the bootstraps. <laughs> Find something, the tiniest, tiniest particle, part, thought, emotion, whatever within you that you can hang on to, that you can hook up onto it and then take it from there. So thank you. And of course, being in nature, yeah. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Oh, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, so this is not either or. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Thank you. And then listen to where you're guided mm. to, who you're to guided to go to. It's just like, well, go see the shrink, and you just go, oh, and you just cr your body cringes and you feel helpless already just thinking about it. That's not the place to go. Somebody says, oh, go to this, go to this cranial sacral person, and your body lights up. You go. Oh, I don't know what that is, but I, that feels right, you know. So follow the track, what you're feeling, and and go where where your heart and your gut lead you. Absolutely. And also, do you think that becoming aware, or maybe they are aware even subconsciously, but accepting it openly and understanding that they are being influenced by negative external energies would help in the process because you know some people you know might freak out oh my god i'm possessed yeah but then i always believe that you can't get rid of something unless you know what it is so you can't fight the invisible so the awareness okay there is some energy that is not me that is interfering with me and so i who is real me need to become stronger and more powerful for this negative energy to go away. Already powerful. Don't need to become powerful. I'm already powerful. But recognizing that. Yeah. In the understanding. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. This is very powerful. And I do hope that uh, that this podcast will 
help some people and obviously I, I encourage again everyone interested in even remotely interested in this topic to get hold of your book and I will include the, all the links in the show notes you know you you, you made a very good um you, you you said something very important just then a little um Anna is that and it's why I wrote the book is we cannot function and deal if we don't know what we're dealing with then it's all self-blame and tilting at phantoms. We haven't got a freaking clue. So once we know what we're dealing with, then we can deal with it. Yes. It's so important. Yeah. No matter how shocking or how unpleasant it is. I mean, if that's the truth and we need to deal with it, well, we need to deal with it. And there is no way around it. Yeah. And, and the reason it's so scary is because we've been fed the program that it's scary. It's not scary. Again, it doesn't have a piece. You can't pick up a, a handkerchief. It's got no power, but we give it power. So there you yeah. go. Speaking about programming, I'd like to bring what is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> because, again, this is one of those hidden, insidious, as you said, program, or one of such programs that, that is not funny. The concept of tension and battle between good and evil as the necessary driver pushing the narrative of life is being perpetuated in our psyche by the Hollywood and even by the books that we buy and read, which say that you must have a good guy and a bad guy, protagonist and antagonist, the nemesis or adversary to interfere with you, trying to stop you on your path. And without this tension, as this programming says, there is no drama, hence the movie, book or life is boring and can't hold our interest, let alone help you grow as a soul and human being. The hero's journey. In other words, to encounter the anti-life force is necessary for you to grow. Here is a big, you know, promotional pitch by those entities. And there are very few creative attempts to show that our progress, growth, interest, and testing our capacities and strengths in simply discovering or rediscovering the beauty and complexity of life without the nemesis, the war, the struggle, the violence, terror, murder, and torture of another. I always felt that this is programming, that there is something not right and I never believe that, that I need to have a protagonist and antagonist in the movie in order to be interested in the movie. I mean, rubbish. In the main, which movies are the box office hits? Those when you have most violence, gratuitous sex, torture, demeaning, degrading others. I mean, and while I'm on my soapbox, <laughs> did you know that true crime is one of the most popular and highest rating category of podcasts in the world. Absolutely. Same thing with books. Please. It is beyond me, to be honest. How can anyone derive pleasure from listening to the violence, terror, murder, and torture of another? I don't come near this sort of material because... It just doesn't resonate. It's completely on a different frequency than, than mine. I mean, that's a very important point, Anna, is on the road to healing. Part of the part of what you can do for yourself is take yourself out of that kind of frequency influence. Don't watch those shows. Don't listen to those podcasts. Don't, you know, don't play violent game video games. T don't watch porn. Hey, don't drink. I mean, I've, you know, actually I've quit alcohol after a lifelong of enjoying alcohol. I finally want, I don't want anything influencing me and taking me out of crystal clarity and my body and my spirit's ability to read energy and know what the heck's going on around me and in me. I love the dance of intoxicating clarity. <laughs> it's beautiful. But no, you're so right. And it's so hard because we're we're in pain. We are in pain. So yes, we're going to self-medicate. It's just the I've spent decades self-medicating. I'm 
finally to the point where I don't. Wow. And um, so the best you do the best you can without beating yourself up. Oh, God, I fell off the wagon and I meant not to drink. You know, don't beat yourself up. You know, just do what you do. Intend, desire to be clear and to be in a place of being able to feel your love. To feel the sweetness of your being. And anything that is going to be violent and lower your light and take you away from that, you know, it's not about being moral. It's not about being moralistic. And it's not about being good. It's about, wow, what kind of frequency influence do I want to influence my being? And then choose it. Choose something higher. Choose something higher. Help. Something life giving something life enhancing not a death enhancing message which is being pulsed relentlessly yes yes absolutely thank you for that i'm curious in the process of writing this book and researching for it have you encountered any negative influences trying to stop oh, yeah. you <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. Like don't, don't 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 do this. Don't do this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but obviously they they didn't succeed. Well, here we go again. There's nothing to. The more I rest in the energy of my own being, the more I rest in my awake, in sense of my embodiment. The more I rest in that and can feel the love of my in my being, it, 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 I don't have to put up a, a curtain of white light around me, a circle of white light to protect myself. My love absolutely just shines. Nothing, you know, back to your original question, nothing can touch us when we are aligned with who we really are. When I am who I really am, nothing can touch me, nothing can influence. And this is the beautiful thing about this whole presence on this planet. It is leaving. You know, it's it's like this looks like dire times that we're in, very difficult and scary and, and torturous, and, and it's, it is difficult times. But we're seeing so much stuff come up because we're ready to deal with it because the light within us can no longer be denied. The light is breaking through and it's revealing the darkness. It's like popping a zit. You know, the old crap has to come out. It's just what happens. And it comes out because there's so much force of love pushing it out. It's a natural li life. only knows life. Its mandate is more life. There is no such thing as actual death. Physically, the body will, will disintegrate. Yeah, fine. But if that's, but that's just a change of state. Easy to say, hard to, hard to grasp. But, you know, this natural impulse of life is taking us to this place where we're dealing with this stuff. We're ready to deal with this stuff. We're ready to move on. And, and when we shine our own light, this force disappears. It cannot stay. It can't hang around. There's nothing for it to feed on. Yeah, thank you. Well, Kate, we have covered quite a lot of ground yeah. in this conversation and, and a number of, of really deep topics, <laughs> but very important. And once again, I encourage our listeners to get hold of your book and read it. Yeah, it is it is something else. This is probably the best way I can I can describe it in in just a couple of words. Is there anything you would like to say as a summary or your final thought to leave our audience with? I guess the, you know, to, to end on a positive note, because, you know, it, it is a dark subject, but it's an exciting, it's, this, it's never been a more exciting time to be alive. Um, is it easy? No, <laughs> it is not. What we're facing is not easy. But where we're headed is where we have longed to be. And again, you, you, the, the light is, is inevitable. It's going to break forth. I, I had a wonderful, um, as I say, I, I used to work with, um, you know, the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And I interviewed um, all of the scientists in that movie. And I and I interviewed Dr. John Hagelin, who was the physicist who was the head of um, uh, uh, string theory, particle string theory at CERN um, in Switzerland. And, um, and I remember asking him, um, 
what was the the you know the hundredth monkey is like you know what the hundredth monkey is okay is the okay so i i asked him how many people on the planet was moving into the state of love and a higher frequency was it going to take to shove humanity into the tipping point and he said yes i have thought about it he said i have calculated it and it is one half of one percent of the global population well that's only eight million people <laughs> so it's like we're so far beyond that figure anna we're so far down the road and as i say it's you know god i hate cliches but they're cliches because they're so bloody true there's it's always darkest before the dawn the light is what's pushing this crap out you know it's like it's on its way out we're on our way back to who we really are and and knowing that and so yeah it's a very positive time <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you and thank you for finishing out this conversation on on such a positive note because it is important not to lose the side of it amongst all the dark and and difficult topics that we talked about and that are all around us lovely well kate thank you so much it's been such a pleasure to have this very uncommon conversation with you and to have you on my quantum living podcast Thank you. I'd like to ask one more thing. Sure. People can check me out at uh, katemontana.com and that's Kate with a C. And I know you probably have this on your website, but also I have a Substack column, essays every week, um, and people can subscribe to that. Yes, I've put in all the links in the show notes on my podcast website. So uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. I really enjoyed our conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Blessings. Aloha. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.